everyone, welcome to my video del dia. Today we will be talking about the indigenous queer identities of the Native American people pre-Hispanic colonization. Let's get right into it. The concept of queerness is one born out of deviating from existing social norms. As a society, we tend to get caught up in biological arguments over the definitions of sex and gender. Although these terms are influenced by biology, there are much wider societal implications that often go ignored in our society. Sex is undoubtedly the most closely associated with biology, with the male and female designations being widely used in science and in certain medical contexts too. Gender, however, is something that's specific to the individual, an identity usually corresponding to being either a man or a woman. However, one can also understand gender to be a spectrum, with one far end representing extreme femininity, with the other far end representing extreme masculinity. Oh. <laughs> These gender categories are loosely based on being male or female, but gender adds additional societal responsibilities and expectations that sex does not. For example, in the United States, to be manly may look like wearing certain clothes, being physically or emotionally strong, or taking on a provider role, etc. We've now moved beyond the physical description of being male to the societal function of being a guy. Men who deviate too far from this narrow view of masculinity are often labeled weak, queer, or a whole host of other pejoratives aimed at getting them back in line. This all, of course, is explored and understood through the context of the Anglo-European societal construction known as the West, or Western Lens. Although forms of patriarchy and heteronormativity have existed in virtually all human societies, we can learn a lot by analyzing the concept of queerness through the Chicano lens. This is a more accurate historical perspective which recognizes the native and indigenous people as they reacted to enslavement, uh, invasion, displacement, and assimilation. Due to this population existing at the intersection of two extremely marginalized identities, being both indigenous and queer, there is not a lot of research on this topic. However, to begin to examine the cultural significance of queerness to the natives, and what settler colonialism in the Americas did to marginalized communities, we begin with the Muche. In the Mexican state of Oaxaca, in the city of Juchitan de Zaragoza, there exist residents who are known to locals as the Muche. Although considered to be male by some, but with additional female attributes, the Muche tend to take on female social roles and live their lives as women through their work, expression, clothes, etc. In the city of Hujatan, the Mushes are generally accepted and tend to get involved in local politics and leadership. Although work tends to be stratified along gender lines, men doing X, women doing Y, Mushes are able to do both. They are not considered homosexual, even though Mushes have a reputation for sleeping with both men and women. As Lynn Steven puts it, the Mushe role is institutionalized for men and therefore is socially tolerated. This is relevant because men who are homosexual but not considered musha in Mexico are still widely disparaged. This has, a lot, this has a lot to do with the Spaniards emphasizing gender deviance and homosexuality as sinful while trying to get the native populations in the Americas to convert to Christianity. While invading the Yucatan, Spanish conquistador Bernal Diaz del Castillo urged the natives, you must not commit sodomy and do the ugly things you are accustomed to do. On February 9th, 2019, Mushe Oscar Carloza was found murdered in their home in Juchitan de Zaragoza, Oaxaca, Mexico. According to the HRC staff, they were human rights activists for the indigenous Zapotec people, the Mushe, and the LGBTQ in Mexico. Unfortunately, murders against political activists, indigenous folk, and gender non-conforming people are not uncommon in Mexico. This is one of the remaining vestiges of the colonial conquests in the Americas. Now, it is unclear whether or not the Muche people were present before the European invasion, but we do know that the indigenous Zapotec people practiced a gender complementary system similar to that of the Mexica or Mistec. Another society with a similar gender system was the Zuni people, just north of Mexico. The Zuni are a native people from the American Southwest that had a system of complementary gender roles, with neither being seen as superior. However, it can be hard to tell if this is the case, because the Spanish only wrote about the male leaders often ignoring the female figureheads. Nonetheless, it seems that variants of gender expression and sexuality were simply more fluid in the Americas. This point is illustrated by Wetwa, who is a prominent Zuni Native American born in 1849. He was a Lamana, a male-bodied person who takes on the social and cultural role of being a woman in Zuni society. Regarded for their strength and endurance, the Lamana were known to do both poetry and weaving, but also large game hunting and chopping wood. Known for wearing female attire and being gendered either way, the Lamana were revered for their religious and cultural leadership, with Wewa being no exception. 
She was a part of the Zuni delegation that visited DC in 1886, and there she met President Glover Cleveland. This is in stark contrast to the Western view of rigid gender roles with men at the top of the pyramid. Just a few centuries earlier, the Spanish believed that women needed tutors for financial transactions, and that female nature was, quote, emotional, unpredictable, and something that needed to be dominated, conquered, and controlled. This mentality persists in Western culture today, and oftentimes informs modern misogynistic attacks on women and those who are too effeminate. Now, some may be quick to label Wewa as transgender, which is also a way the Western lens is influencing our thinking in this discussion. The idea of being transgender is one born out of the modern Western philosophy of the world, and is not one that correlates 100% with native identities. The term transgender may not be enough to recognize the implicit native experience that being a Lamana entails, and could reduce people like Wewa to their gender expression rather than their communal legacy. The concept of being two-spirit may be more helpful here, which is a modern pan-Indian concept for those that experience gender deviation. It has been critiqued for not being inclusive to all Native American societies, but is still widely favored and used throughout the United States. Another term used throughout history that has fallen out of favor, Berdache, is used to describe a whole range of different gender and sexual expressions encountered with Native peoples. Debates still flare over whether or not to consider their Berdache gender crossing, third gender, androgynous, or half man, half woman. Although the Western lens struggles to make sense of these identities, the Chicano lens recognizes the diversity and unique practices of all Native societies before and during the Colombian, the Colombian invasion. We may not need a perfect label if we take the time to understand and teach these things as normal rather than falling back on old traditional ways. To end things off, I wanted to bring things a lot closer to home and talk about the gender dynamics of the Native people of the Willamette Valley. The Kalapuya people are the natives of the land I am currently existing on top of here in Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. They were a patriarchal society, usually led in social and political life by the man with the greatest wealth. However, it was easier for a woman to gain status through spiritual leadership. Ritual leaders could be either gender, and their spiritual prowess oftentimes was even more respected than that than the riches of others. Because of this, June 10, Dosk, and Rogers note that the spiritual leaders shaped local society even more than their political counterparts. They were a patriarchal society, usually led in social and political life by the man with the greatest wealth. Like other native societies discussed, they had segregated work patterns, with the men usually hunting, while the women and children would gather food and set up camp. The women were integral to the system, as the majority of the Kalapuya diet was made up of gathered food. There are historical records of a gender-variant Kalapuya spiritual leader named... Oh gosh, guys, I'm gonna butcher this. Shimson? Shimson? Shimson. Now, here's John B. Hudson in his interview from the Kalapuya text describing this gender-variant person. They would say, he is a man in body, but he has changed to a woman in dress and manner of life. But he is not a woman in body. It is his spirit power that has told him, you become woman. You are always to wear women's dress, just like women. That is the way you must always do. This example shows that throughout many different native societies, people with gender variant expression often took religious or communal leadership roles in their community. Rather than being subjected by religion for their sins, they operated in tandem with spirituality, and oftentimes were elevated within their society because of this. Although there may have been some gender variation among spiritual leaders in the Kalapuya people, after the arrival of European settler colonialists, the number of the Kalapuya people dropped dramatically. The Confederate tribes of Grand Ronde explained that the creation of the Grand Ronde Reservation through treaties between the U.S. and tribal nations came with the forced removal of native people from their ancestral homeland. This devastated their populations, and they were forced to either assimilate into U.S. society or live their lives on the reservation. Any other gender-variant parts of the Kalapuya society, along with so much else, may be lost to time forever. Now, as is evident, having toured various pre-colonial societies, the sexual and gender expressions of the native peoples were broad and not limited to the mindset of the old world. From the Muche people of Huchitan, who continued to fight for their rights, to the Lamana people of the Zuni society, many natives who would be thought of as queer took important leadership roles within their community. This is certainly true of the Kalapuya, but there is still much left to be explored about native queer identities in the Americas. The Kalapuya people, the Zapotec, and Zuni have given us a chance to explore what gender and sexuality means in a wider context through the Chicano lens. It is our job now to recognize our queer ancestors for the leaders they were, and to seek knowledge and truth about our own history and realities. Let us continue the tradition of queer leadership and expand it to our often ignored indigenous, black, and brown brothers and sisters. This is Sheena Be Anything. 
Thank you for tuning in and have a wonderful day, guys. Happy Pride Month, everybody. Ah! Hot in here, hot in here, hot in here. Mama.